right, it's 6 o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. We have a full quorum present, or excuse me, we have a quorum present. Trustee Swartle, Trustee Graves, myself, Trustee Benyon, Trustee uh, Baker, as well as our last meeting with our interim superintendent, Mr. John Blackman. So um, let's go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Appreciate that. And for the annual budget hearing on this June 4th, 2014, um, We'll go ahead and commence with that and move straight into the public comment. Uh, Ms. Kaufman, has, has there been any requests for public comment? I have not received any cards. Okay. Out of, we'll go ahead and open that uh, up to the public that's here. Is there anyone who would like to make a comment concerning the, uh, the budget this evening? Okay, if you wouldn't mind stepping up to the microphone, stating your name, please. Name and address. My name is Tom Richmond. I live at 126 Willow Zinsburg, subdivision, Lane County. I don't have too much to comment on, but I think I saw somewhere where there's $16 million carryover surplus. And I'm wondering if we couldn't help the county road and bridge department out there needing some money. And our school buses travel those roads every day. Or during the school year, we make 360 round trips through the subdivision and on these roads. And I just hate to see additional tax increases of any kind. And, and you know, think of the maintenance and save on our buses, you know, the front end alignments, and tires, and the students would get shaken up so much, shaken up so much. And, I think it'd be a worthwhile expenditure. We make a lot of other expenditures, I think, that are no more questionable. And the other thing I want to say is, well, I'll pass on that. <laughs> it's somewhat negative. Um, thank you for your time. I'd like to see you consider that. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. Anybody else? All right, with that, we'll go ahead and move into the consideration of the 2014-15 Blaine County School District budget with uh, Mr. Mike Chatterton taking the helm. Okay, first of all, uh, I'd like to <coughs> address Mr. Richmond's concerns. The $16 million that I believe he's referring to is, is actually in the school plant facilities money, and that money is set aside money to pay off the QSCB bonds as they come start maturing in uh, two years. So the carryover of the general fund is much less than $16 million, as we've talked about over the last five budget meetings. Uh, it's going to be closer to $9 million, and if it looks at like this year, it's going to take about $7 million to get through the current year if we sp spent all of the expenditures that we have budgeted. So, you know, the, the carryover, true carryover number within the general fund is much less than the $16 million. And I, I don't think statute would even allow us to transfer funds from one governmental agency to another governmental agency. So first of all, I want to address a couple of, of things. Uh, in the recent newspaper article, it stated that the, our budget was $80.6 million. That's a little misleading because when you look at how much money we have in the contingency in the general fund, which is for unforeseen circumstances, which takes board approval to move the out of contingency, that's $2.6 million. We have $16.2 million in unappropriated balance in the school plant facility levy that set aside money to pay off the QSCB bonds as they start maturing in 2016. We also have $2.4 million in the land lottery fund that's not anticipa anticipated to be spent this year. So when you deduct those costs out of the actual 
the $80.6 million. The actual true budget of planned expenditures for this coming year is $59.4 million. And as in the past, there's a lot of that. Some of that money doesn't ever get spent. Roughly about 7 to 8 percent of that money doesn't get spent on an annual basis. Salary and benefits represents 84.2 uh, percent of the general fund budget ex budgeted expenditures. Uh, the general fund budget overall this year is slightly less than it was last year. I think we've done a good job on reallocating resources, reallocating positions, looking at positions that were not necessary and reallocating into those positions that we really felt were necessary. Uh, the stabilization levy is a levy that was represented to be $32.2 million. It's actually $29.5 million. We do have some additional small levies within the general fund that's not a budget stabilization levy. Uh, and then the only other thing is the $16.2 million I want to reiterate is, is that money is not money that's, that's ever going to be spent on another project unless for unforeseen circumstance we had a huge enrollment to where we had to look at doing an elementary school sometime in the near future. But that money is set aside to pay off those bonds as they start maturing and we have to pay the obligations of those starting in August of 2016. Uh, those payments will be roughly about $5.5 million each year from 2016 to 2020 to pay off those obligations. Okay, That's really all I had prepared for the, the budget. We've gone through the budget quite a bit in the last several months, so unless you have any questions. I just want to thank you, Mike, for working with the board and, and uh, doing a, a drastically different budgeting process this year, keeping us updated over five or six work sessions as well as discussing the budget at our last meeting. Also, um, we've had, we as a board have had a chance to really dive in and, and digest it a lot deeper, um, more fully, thoroughly, um, be able to ask questions. Um, and I really, really appreciate your, your assistance with that to, to help a, a fairly new board understand um, the ins and outs of the budget. Um, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up to the board for, for questions. I can barely hear you. <laughs> I got a hearing problem. <laughs> I apologize. Too. I'll try to speak up. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. The, the, what did we have? Four meetings or five, five. budget meetings? Five. five budget meetings has been much better for me to understand it because it was always hard to have a workshop in May and then be passing the budget a month later. So it's been much more helpful to understand this. It, so I don't have many questions uh, right now because I feel like I thoroughly understand it. Our, our general fund budget is under, you said, what it was last year yeah. at 50. Yeah, it's, it's several thousand lower than last year's general fund budget. Right, so it's 56, 59.4. Yeah, the actual general fund budget is around Less. 55 million. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what I was looking for. The 55, um, and a couple of years ago, I think it was up to 58 or 57 or 58. So we've actually decreased that that budget, which I think is a big kudos to to staff. So. I will agree. I, I know the staff has worked extremely hard reallocating positions, trying to extend offer new positions where we find the needs of the district, um, be able to do that through attrition. So I, I, I congratulate uh, John Blackman and the, the whole administrative team for the work that they did this year with that as well. They were able to create nine positions for us through attrition alone, through reallocation. So thank you very much. Yeah, we would have been up several million dollars had that not have happened with the positions that we did need to hire. So thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, make one comment. It, it took me a while to be able to really quantify this. So, and I think it's helpful um, as far as the big picture. Out of every dollar that the public spends, 50% this year, 50% is going for teachers, salaries, and benefits. 25% is going for other staff, salaries, and benefits. 25% is going for construction buildings and supplies, so non-staff needs. 
Um, and that's really important. I think that that's, that really drills down rather than creating subsets of the budget. It's, that's, the, that's the whole nut, and that's a very important number for me to know. Any other comments, questions? I think that um, that's a pretty close assessment, but when you look at the salary and benefits total, it's 84% of the budget? Well, it's 84% of the, of, the, uh, of the general fund. Of the yes. general fund, right. Oh, you're right. counting the levy money Absolutely. that's specifically for? It's, it's real money for the public that is. Right, that but it's spent. not our operating budget for month, our annual operating budget. Right, right. Okay, because otherwise it would be I don't know what the split would be of that 84% teachers versus support, but I think it's 60 plus percent teachers. That would make sense if it's 50-25, yeah. it'd be 60-20, 60, 60, 60, 60, or 25 or something. something. Yeah, okay. I just was trying to clear, understand what mm -hmm. you were referring to with those particular numbers. And also just another comment, I mean, Mike, thank you so much for all the work you put into accommodating um, what the board needed to be able to make this a successful uh, budget review process as well as your entire team because I know that that put a great burden on other administrators at the school level within your district or within your department and all of those people came together to make that a successful those successful presentations so I just want to thank you for that and I don't have any other questions I think it was very well vetted in those five meetings that Seated over 12 hours of discussion, and uh, thank you. You're welcome. All right. With that, then, do I hear a motion to accept the 2014-15 Blaine County School District budget as presented? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Go ahead and do a, a roll call vote. Trustee Schwartel. Aye. Trustee Graves. Aye. Trustee Baker. Aye. Trustee Benyon. Aye. Uh, Motion carries, budget accepted. With that, we will go ahead and adjourn the budget meeting and reconvene at 6.30 to go on with the regular June school board meeting. Can I keep going? Yeah, keep going. yeah I think that would be great. Yeah, we'll great use of time. Oh, are you going to? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're going to get your pictures taken. Yeah, we'll be back in five or ten minutes. Yeah, we'll be back. Bummer. <laughs> and we'll continue as soon as we could. The <coughs> They'd like some updated pictures really quickly, so we will be back momentarily. About 6.30, you know, because... Okay. So where are we going to... We're going to go to All Sun or All Shade. Either one from here. Okay. All Shade. <laughs>
Molly was hot. Appreciate everybody's patience with us as we uh, got some updated photos for the website. Um, with that, we'll reconvene and go ahead and move in with the opening statement by Trustee Schwartel. Okay. What did I do with it? it should be here. Lori, can I have it back? Can I leave it away? Can I have a statement? I have, oh, here it is. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, the, I went to two out of the three graduations this year, and I in, thoroughly enjoyed them. And the only one that I missed was Carrie, and I'm very sorry to have missed that. I had a, another family obligation that night. But what I was really impressed by was the speeches. I just thought that they were incredible. I, you know, they, all, they left me with a real message. Um, so I'd like to recap some of what I heard. At Wood River High School, math teacher Glenn Lindsley spoke of the gift of failure. He said that it's by learning from our failures that we achieve true success. We need to embrace and be grateful for our failures and our human struggles, for they have much to teach us. And he shared a personal anecdote, and I, I was just so impressed. It was from the heart. At Silver Creek, the speaker was Greg Sumner, who is executive director of Idaho Drug Free Youth. Mr. Sumner drove all the way from northern Idaho at the request of the students who had met him in the, sometime during the school year and had been incredibly impressed um, to deliver a speech about the importance of reaching out to connect with others. He showed that when we connect with other people, we create a powerful flow of energy that can literally light up the world. And Cary High School celebrated its 90th graduation. Their speaker was teacher Elizabeth Young, who channeled David Letterman with a top 10 list. Cary High School salutary, salutarian Lily Riviera added her wisdom by encouraging students to never stop learning. What wonderful messages these speeches contained. They're all relevant to us as we experience our own life passages. I know the board joins me in thanking all of the speakers. And I, in wishing the class of 2014 all the best. Thank you. Very nice. Appreciate that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Are there any additions, corrections, modifications, substitutions to the current agenda? The agenda that was noticed contained under uh, State of the District, uh, Mr. Blackman. Uh, was going to have something about the Grow Your Own program. We're going to actually take that off, and we'll show on the, on the agenda, take that off and address that at a later date. That's the only thing I have. All right, I appreciate that. Do I have a, here a motion to um, delete the item from the State of the District by Mr. John Blackman of Grow Your Own? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Agenda amended. And with that, we will turn the time over to Lori Coughlin. And Rick Roberts. Rick, would you like to be addressed as Rick or Richard? Rick. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go like this a little bit for the webcast. But basically, this is your oath of office as trustee to fill the vacancy in zone four for the next almost three years. <laughs> All right. And if you can repeat after me. I do affirm I do affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the laws of the state. And the laws of the state. And that I will faithfully discharge all the duties. And that I will faithfully 
discharge all the duties by the Office of Trustee of Blaine County School District. Of the Office of Trustee of Blaine County School District. Number one. Number one. <laughs> in Blaine County. In Blaine County. State of Idaho. State of Idaho. <laughs> according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my abilities. Congratulations. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Appreciate that, Ms. Kaufman and, and Rick. I'd like to officially welcome you to the uh, soon-to-be-named position. <laughs> 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 if that's flashing in your face, maybe okay. All right, we got to get a better configuration here. Mm -hmm. All right, and also, um, Trustee Schwartel reminded me I forgot to do this earlier. Um, we have. And one of our student board representatives here in the public with us tonight, um, Nikki Penrose. We appreciate you being here and welcome you and look forward to working with you. So. All right. And we will turn the time over to now to Mr. John Blackman for the accolades. I'm an accolade here. Dear Board of Trustees, it is with great pleasure that I write this accolade for a truly amazing administrator, Angie Martinez. I have known Ms. Martinez for the past 15 years and have had the distinct honor to serve as her summer school principal years ago when I first started a new administration. And more recently as her interim superintendent and HR director at the district level. I cannot emphasize enough that her devout dedication and commitment to the children of Blaine County and the quality of their educational learning opportunities. Ms. Martinez embodies the essence of educational leadership. In her first year as our Director of Instruction and Learning, she has brought forward renewed focus in our district strategic plan and most importantly, put our students' learning experiences at the very core of that focus. Ms. Martinez has opened our eyes to the processes of developing 21st century skills in our students and staff alike while maintaining discussions structured around the whole child and how we approach the improvement of the learning experience for all students. Under her curricular guidance, our district is moving from a good district to a great one, and she is setting the stage for true 21st century teaching and learning to flourish. Additionally, Ms. Martinez is a consummate um, professional who always puts the whole of herself into any and all endeavors she undertakes. I think I call her a workhorse. <laughs> She is a person who consistently challenges herself through the acquisition of knowledge and new experiences which she readily imparts to the rest of her colleagues. I can honestly say that I would not have been able to carry out the multiple functions of my current responsibilities if it were not for the amazing dedication and hard work of that woman. Colleagues hold her opinions and expertise in high esteem. Ms. Angie Martinez is one of the very best leaders and educators that I have had the pleasure to know and work with over the 30 years that I have spent in public education here in Blake County. She is a person of the highest caliber whom I can trust explicitly. We should count ourselves fortunate and blessed to have her serving the children and staff of the Blake County School District. Sincerely, me. <laughs> presentations and I just want to focus on the teachers that have done the work uh, without their dedication and commitment to the projects that are going on in this district we would not be down this path so I just want to thank them for helping us look good and working hard for on behalf of students so thanks to all of those teachers appreciate it and thank you John it was a very nice letter <laughs> thank you for step, taking the position <laughs> With that, we will move into public comment. And is there any public comment received for tonight? All right. Out of 
courtesy, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment for this portion of the meeting as well. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and proceed. And move on with the consent agenda. And under the consent agenda, we have consideration of minutes. Special meeting of the board, May 19th, 2014. Special meeting of the board, May 27th, 2014. Special meeting of the board, May 28th, 2014. Special meeting of the board, June 2nd, 2014. By a mistake. Okay. By a mistake. What are you trying May to say, Lori? <laughs> <coughs> May 27th. <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> the item B, acceptance of monthly financial report. Item C, consideration of annual and regular July board meeting date change from July 8th to the 15th. <laughs> That's for me. I, I can't be here the 8th. Okay. Um, rehire con uh, continuing contracts, teachers category two and three. Item E, consideration of recommended bids for purchase of buses. Uh, item F, permission to advertise for the sale of buses. Item G, certification of resident transfer of Blaine County students to Minidoka County, payment of tuition and or transportation. And item H, approval of personnel exiting and entering. And Lori, do you happen to have those? I do. And it's a busy time of year. Under classified uh, staff exiting, Freddie Velasco, custodian at the community campus. And recommending for hire, Martin E. Martin e. Millard, custodian at the community campus. Freddie Velasco, custodian, community campus and Samuel B. Glenn, custodian at Wood River High School. Under classified uh, coaching staff exiting, Heather Miller, head varsity girls cross country coach at Wood River High School, Rhett Jones, assistant wrestling coach at Wood River High School. Classified recommend, uh, coaching staff recommending for hire, Carrie Bingham, assistic, assistant wrestling coach, Wood River High School, John Humphreys, assistant football coach, Wood River High School, Rhett Jones, head wrestling coach, Wood River High School, and Sarah Meeks, assistant cheerleading coach at Wood River High School. Under certified staff exiting, these are all cate category, oh, the first one is category two non-renewal. Jennifer King, science teacher uh, at Wood River High School. Jennifer Boatwright, uh, elementary teacher, uh, kindergarten teacher, Haley Elementary School, and Brooke Hand. Um, great, uh, second grade bilingual Spanish dual immersion teacher at Woodside Elementary School. Under certified staff recommending for hire, these are all cat category two contracts. Samantha Archibald Mora, uh, full-time Spanish teacher at Wood River Middle School. Erin Corwin, Corwin or Corwin, uh, math teacher at Wood River Middle School. Richard Scott, full-time science teacher at Wood River Middle School. Thorsten Topp, full-time social studies teacher at Silver Creek High School. Jen uh, Jeanette M. McElhaney, uh, full-time social worker at Haley Elementary School. Pamela Duquette, full-time uh, GATE, gifted and talented education teacher at Hemingway Elementary School. Elaine Paklemba, first grade dual immersion English side teacher at Alturas Elementary School. Maria Pina, Third grade bilingual Spanish dual immersion, immersion teacher at Alturas Elementary School. Kelly Ortego, full-time fourth grade dual immersion English side teacher, Alturas Elementary School. Kylie Krill, full-time fifth grade dual immersion English side teacher at Alturas Elementary School. Andrea Gallegos, full-time fourth grade teacher at Bellevue Elementary School. And Dorothy Madsen, full-time reading teacher at Hemingway Elementary School. That is all. All right. Do I hear a motion to... Oh, okay. I just have a really quick question. I see Freddie Velasco, and I'm just wondering, is that a father-son <laughs> situation? I asked the same question. Yeah. And what, what that is, I went to uh, one of our HR people. Mm -hmm. I said, is this a mistake, or am I seeing this wrong? Yeah. And what happened, it was a 30-day period. Oh. Where okay. He Thank started you. work, and then he quit work. 
so he was also he was entering and exiting it. Okay, so thank you. So it's kind of a wash. Of yeah, that. got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. With that, then, do I hear a motion to accept the consent agenda as read? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Consent agenda passed. We will Moving now right continue along. on to the guest presentation with the Environmental Practices Committee update. Yes. yes, if you would please, Ms. Erica Greenberg, Wood River High School teacher. Thanks for letting me come and give my spiel on behalf of the committee. We're quite a large group and we represent every school in the district and we also have um, grub maintenance on the committee as well as my chairman from the district office and Dwayne Sorensen from the food services. So we've got a wide spectrum and I'll try to make it quick. Each of the different buildings have given their input, but um, we'll go ahead. So Hemingway, um, all of the elementary schools are doing recycling in every classroom, and that includes everything that can be recycled. So plastic, I'm not sure what the glass means for Hemingway, because in Haley, we no longer recycle the glass in the schools. But um, we do the cans, aluminum, paper, corrugated um, cardboard. They're doing their milk cartons. Um, and that, is a, that, is, that applies to all of our elementary schools. Every school is doing that. Um, in all of their classrooms, if not in a central location. And then Hemingway was our pilot school last year when I presented to you guys for the composting. And then in the meantime, all of the kitchens were doing the composting in the other buildings. They've been successful in their pilot year and they've moved on to third and fifth, or they've moved on from their third and fifth grades and added their first and second grades. <coughs> um, Haley won the recycle bowl again um, for the second year in a row, so they won a thousand dollars to go to um, <coughs> student activities and projects to be continued and they also this year started composting in kindergarten for a pilot and in the fall we'll reconvene and see how successful that was and then add additional grades as see fit. Woodside is our go-getter school. They're, they're doing above and beyond. They're making videos to um, get kids excited about their composting. They also piloted this spring. Um, they are doing the recycling. Marianne Ward and Stephanie Kane are the representatives from that school. Um, and then they've got some pictures right after this slide. These are the kids. This is their composting station. And in the video, you guys can go back later if we have time at the end, you guys can watch it. But they have the bins for garbage recyclables, their silverware, and then their composting bins. And then they've been making projects out of recycled materials throughout the different classes. This is their video, but we can skip that for right now. Um, Bellevue also is, is really on board. This is Jacqueline Jones. Um, it's the representative for this school. They also are recycling all of the different items. These are pictures from some of the classrooms. And then the next slide is um, quotes from some of the teachers that Jackson went out and got, and then the students making projects out of the different materials that they either inherited from other buildings, or kids have brought in, or parents have dropped off. Um, and then these are some of their projects from the art gallery that they put on, and they really focused on the word upcycle in their fifth grade classes. And then this is Jacqueline's collage. <laughs> All of her students did a, they did a cleanup effort. Um, they have an eco challenge in the bottom right corner. Again, more projects going on on the side. The kids in the middle with their jewelry. Again, upcycle, upcycle, upcycle. Um, they also are piloting a composting program. Um, they uh, already had the kitchen staff on board, but you can see they're helping the kids learn how to go through the line, and they're not throwing away their silverware, which was a big concern. And then the trays obviously are washed and they're recycling um, up the top right. Cary School is our only school that's not included in the composting program, like I mentioned last year. Clear Creek is the organization that we're working with, and they don't drive out to Cary to pick up that composting. So they're doing their part in other ways. They've got the solar panels that's helping out the electricity. They have a highway cleanup um, organized by the student council. Um, Mr. Durchie's science classes, so do the Envirothon, and then 87 students and staff members took part in the, part in the walk bike to school, which is awesome. Thanks, that means a lot. Um, the middle school, we had a hard time getting a hold of a representative, but it is Brian Sturgis, and he was really great towards the end of the year with helping us um, compile information from his school. Um, he sent out a survey to the staff, and I think, I believe he said 27 staff reported 
reported back on what they're recycling in their room. And then the high school was a lot of money to purchase new bins that don't leak onto the floors, which was an issue in the past. <laughs> so these are a picture. Every station has four bins, one's for paper, one's for cans, one's for plastic, and then trash. And then the kids are the water club kids are responsible for taking the recycling out that it's all through the hall. So I think there's 15 sets in the school. Wow. It's a lot. And they're smaller, so it has to happen more frequently, which sometimes it doesn't. So <laughs> Um, we worked with a senior a few years ago, and her senior project was to adopt the highway, and she suckered us into doing that. So um, we have kids that come out on their weekends and um, clean up trash. We're right past the blinking light just over the hill. Um, so this was our group in the fall that helped pick up. And then the parade, we were able to pair with the ERC um, and the Blue Land Trust, and they handed out a bunch of swag for us to pass out of the um, parade that we did at the homecoming parade in the fall. So kids have bags over their arms that they're passing out recycling information from the county and reusable bags from the ERC water bottles and t-shirts. Um, and then the WOW project with the high schoolers, we were able to again pair with the ERC. This was finalizing our recycling bins in the parks that we purchased last year. Um, this was during Clean Sweep. Clean Sweep and our Bay ended up the same day. So this is a presentation from the mayor. Um, and WOW and the ERC and the club all coming together, the bins are in the parks, so they're there for the community. How much is the check for? Um, 2,175. Okay. Um, and then since our elementary schools are all um, educated and learning how to compost, the next uh, logical step is to educate our middle school and high school students. So with the help of a mentor in the community, we will be working starting in August to build something like this um, for a recycling slash composting station in our cafeteria. So we're going to focus on the, this says the high school, we're going to focus on the middle school first since we'll have Hemingway and elementary students coming from Haley as well um, into that lunchroom and we want to make sure that we don't break the chain there, that they can still compost in that building as well. So find something that's going to be visually stimulating. We've talked about maybe having a shark with its mouth open. I don't know, see what we come up with in the fall. Um, and then grounds and maintenance. Um, Howie's been really great on this end. He's a great advocate along with Wayne and food, food services. So um, they, he's really great about looking into what they can recycle and helping get that done. Composting, he and Dwayne really helped facilitate that so that it was a possibility. We just threw out the ideas and they really made it happen. Um, and then he's also looked into and met with the Wood River Land Trust about trout friendly lawns. So we will be receiving signs from them for each of our campuses, depending on what level and what status we have achieved for each campus. Um, water conservation, um, they're looking for ways to cut back on their water usage. Um, same with the energy conservation and the pesticides goes along with the Wood River Land Trust. Um, birds who love the dandelions a little bit more, I guess. Do you guys have any questions for me? Well, I have a couple. First, how long have you been doing this and leading this effort I in these clubs? I've only been the chair of this committee for two years. For two years. I've been on it for like five or six years. That's what I feel like, and I just want to thank you for doing it for so long because you've really accomplished a lot. And the, the second question is about the, the composting. And in some schools, it was certain grades that were doing that. Yeah, I don't. In Hemingway, Rita was running. Remington is a representative there, and it was all on her. So she was giving up her lunches to make sure that kids were doing it. And she focused on one grade. Oh, I um, see. And they, and the grades, they have different times that they go to the lunchroom sure or something. To be. Okay. Actually, so, um, I, I think it was just a manageable amount for the person that was taking it on. So in some schools, there's more than one representative. Like Woodside, Marion was able to, you know, meet with every student, and she sees every student and made a video. And those kids got all on board, and she had the help of Stephanie, so it didn't fall on one person's shoulders. But Rita really, she was a fighter. So how does that work? So they compost at lunch, and then there's bags, and then that comes out to the that bag garbage, gets and, then and then it gets back, and okay. then it gets picked up. And picked up, week, yeah. and it's composted at a, a Yeah, a his name is general. Wynn, I don't know why I couldn't tell his last name, but Wynn has a facility out of Ohio Gulch as well. Okay. And he has, they're trying to up the composting. No. Compostable materials. So right. He has the facility to do it. It's just a matter of supply amounts. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for all your work on this, Erica. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anything else from the board? I'd just like to add that, you know, um, it's really exciting to see a teacher with such passion towards an area give up so much of her time for the students to ignite their passion. And, uh, you know, that's it's such a, uh, an amazing motivator for people. You know, it's not about those extrinsic rewards, but the internal ones, the passion that drives it. And uh, it's pretty amazing when you see what's going on on the internet and people who just donate their time. I don't know if you all remember a product called um, Encarta that was mm -hmm. put out by uh, Microsoft. And uh, what happened to it was a thing called Wikipedia, mm -hmm. which was driven by people's passions rather than money. So they threw $100 million at Encarta, which disappeared. No money was put toward Wikipedia, and it's the standard. So it's amazing what passion can do. And yeah. you're living proof of that, so thank you so much. Thank you. What are your goals for next year? That's a really good question. Um, I think to implement successfully the composting at the middle and high school, um, and then we're going to start looking into the paper usage in each of the buildings. Um, there are some buildings that have a really good grip on the paper usage that's going on, but um, if we're going to continue to buy special paper for certain buildings, we need to make sure that we're being responsible with it. So I think just looking into that, and I think teachers are on board for the most part, but change is difficult in any circumstance. So. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for all your efforts. So, I apologize. Not, I apologize. It does take donations. All right. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and move on with the uh, <clears throat> stay of the district with Mr. John Blackman. Okay. Um, just a couple of highlights. I, I really wanted to give you, um, you know, the, the state of the staff engagement survey. Um, we're still compiling a lot of that information, and we'll have it all for you in July. Um, but just to give you some highlights of that, um, I did meet with um, you know the Blaine County School District um, administration, but myself, Heather, and Trinji Van Slyke, BCA president, got together regarding the questions that were in that, and making sure that we were all on the same page um, with the questions that went out. Um, admin council also had their input into that. All the, all the district administrators. Uh, the survey launched on May 15th and closed May 30th. Uh, two-week time uh, period, and in that time, um, there was a lot of publicity that went out on Heather's part. I want to appreciate that because we had a huge response rate. So um, we sent out uh, 547 invitations, and we had 370, roughly 369 completed surveys for a response rate of, of 68%. Wow, that's is huge. What, that is, that's a big response rate for a survey. So um, a couple highlights. Uh, from that, just to you know, explain a little bit about the difference between the, the district climate survey that we did and the staff engagement survey that we did. So the quick uh, K-12 Insights is still working on those reports, and, and uh, Heather will make sure that we get those distributed to you in July. Um, there are several reports, uh, the district level report, including uh, theme analysis um, from the verbatim responses. The district level report will be published on the website. Um, a report by each school and each department that had more than 10 responses. So most, most of them had that. I think we all met that. Um, uh, a report of, and those reports will include um, within the school or, or department reports, there will be a comparison for each question between the school or department um, average and the district average. So we'll be able to compare, you know, say the maintenance department with the district average, so, and how they compare. So kind of like what we did with the climate survey where we compared the school's data to the district data, we'll be able to also do that with this, with the staff engagement survey. Um, the school or department reports will go to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and each um, principal and director or director. PowerPoint presentation will be made to each school slash or department um, staff upon request. Uh, verbatim responses will only go to the superintendent, the new superintendent, and myself. So, um, and that has to do with the confidentiality and making sure people are comfortable and making, you know, in, in giving their free responses. Um, according to, uh, let's see, in general, climate surveys are um, the difference is that climate surveys ask stakeholders to reflect on their school environment. 
whereas the engagement survey asks stakeholders to think about their unique experiences in their role um, and connections um, with their colleagues and how these relationships impact their work environment. So one's more about the, the school uh, environment and one's more about the working environment. So in staff climate surveys, we typically include topics such as academic preparation, um, school, uh, student support, school leadership, school operations, educational programming, and services. In staff engagement surveys, the items are organized by shared values, communication, feedback, recognition, career growth, and training opportunities. So that gives you a little bit about the difference between the two. Um, and it's going to give us some nice baseline data in this first year to be able to see what those responses are and be able to look at what steps we take in promoting those perceptions and, and making sure that, that we're doing what we can to improve those. And then we'll have that baseline data to be able to compare it to from year to year to see if those measures that we take are being effective. That's that. That's right. All right. Thank you for that explanation. Appreciate that. Look forward to, to seeing the data. So, moves on to me with the board chair report. And under item A, the financial advisory committee. It, now, this is a committee that uh, we as a board um, decided to set up and go ahead and put the policy together and put it out to the community to accept applications to be on that committee. Um, we as a board had not discussed when we wanted to end that um, application process. Um, so there's a, there's a few things um, to, to consider. And as a, as a board, we'll go ahead and open it up for discussion a little bit about it as well at this point also. But uh, in speaking with uh, our new superintendent, um, Dr. Gwen Carroll Holmes, who will be joining us the 1st of July, um, touching on the Financial Advisory Committee, we kind of put the cart before the horse a little bit on this one. We sent out to accept applications for the committee without having a specific um, task or, or things for them to, to accomplish. And touching a, a little bit on it later on as well, but in the board retreat, the, the Financial Advisory Committee and, and the items that we would like them to look at is one of the, our topics for discussion at the board retreat. Um, so for me personally, I'm a little hesitant. Of, and I'd like to thank all those in the public who have shown interest in and um, applied for the committee. We are still accepting applications. We have not closed it as of this point. Um, and so we've had five community members and one staff member put in their application for that committee. We, like I say, we want to appreciate those. Um, and please keep posted. We'll get back with you when we have a more clear, defined definition of what we want the, the committee to look like. Um, and, or not what we want it to look like, some of the tasks that we have for you to, to do. And based on the tasks that we have for them to do, might change who we have on the committee a little bit, might play to some of their strengths. And in talking with, with Dr. Holmes today, it's, it's her recommendation that we kind of hold off a little bit on a, appointing members of the committee yet uh, to keep in contact with those who have put their names in and thank them again for their um, continued and hopeful, hopefully their continued um, assistance on the, on the committee if they are so chosen, but to hold off on, on placing those committee members until we have a, a set tasks or set tasks for them to accomplish. That way we can kind of play to their strengths um, and, and really go through their, their resumes and, and their applications and, and choose the ones who, who would play to the strengths of, of what we're defining and asking them to accomplish in, in the task. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up for discussion all from, from board members. If you might just want to tell the public when the board retreat is. Um, just so that it's they can July. Uh, July 25th, 26th. Okay. We will be convening that committee, but we want to make sure we have things for them to do and, and a set prescribed what the board is looking for. And, and that's something that we as a board need to be discussing and deciding together. So. I just want to um, kind of tag on that. Um, in talking with Gwen Carroll, you know, since this is a brand new committee and it's in the, in the wake of her getting ready to start in weeks, 
that um, she felt that it would be really important for the board to sit together and be able to discuss, you know, what is it going to look like? How is it going to work? We have a new board member who probably doesn't even know what we're talking about yet. <laughs> no. Um, how that communication will work, um, how those duties will be assigned, and um, to be sure that we're in contact, and Lori has responded to all of the people who have applied, but to continue to be in contact with them so they don't feel discouraged, mm -hmm. so they understand that this still is very important, it's something that we are moving forward with, but, um, you know, there's a time and a place, and to make sure that we had all these things worked out before we went forward with it. And I agreed with her opinion on that. All right. Okay, I guess the only thing that I would say, and, that's, and if that's the, the recommendation, I think that's fine. But I, too, would appreciate, Lori, if you would contact them again, yeah. again this week. Just to, sometimes it's nice just to hear that you don't know anything yet, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah, to, keep in to, to keep into communication and, and that we will be um, giving more definition to, the, to this advisory board at our board retreat. Okay. You know. I think that's an excellent idea. I appreciate that, Catherine. Yeah, I think that's yeah, incredibly important just because, yeah, great. The message that we might send might not be the one that we want to if we don't do that. <laughs> and right. we got some phenomenal people. We did. We have phenomenal people with amazing backgrounds and experience for this committee. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was really interesting that 11 people applied to be on the wellness committee, but only five from the public yep. applied to be on the financial committee. Just a point of interest. <laughs> All right. Continuing on to item B, we have the announcements and due to summer, June, July, August, uh, we're not going to have any special meetings or work sessions, hopefully. <laughs> no work sessions and hopefully no special meetings. We'll see how that goes. Um, our annual regular July, or excuse me, our annual and our regular July meeting, same day, will be held on July 15th at 6 p.m. As, as amended. That will actually be the third Tuesday of that month instead of the second. Um, due to work conflicts, there's no way possi possible for me to be there. Uh, and I believe you as well, Liz, on that second Tuesday Coming due to company. work schedules. So that's, that's kind of the reasoning for that move. Um, our board retreat, we have scheduled um, a two-day, two-full-day retreat. July 25th and 26th, we're going to be at the Sun Valley Inn at the Aspen Room, I believe, and going from 8 to 6 on both days. Um, we have, a f after a conference call with, with uh, Gwen Carroll Holmes earlier this afternoon, we have a, a fairly full agenda, would you say? Yeah. So we're going to have to she make said, sure we... She said, do we have a week? <laughs> We might have a point second on one. Topic, so. um, and we have booked uh, Jackie Hopper to be our facilitator, who used to work with ISBA, uh, Idaho School Boards Association, but now does contract work through them. So she will be our facilitator. She has some history with the district and, and knows our district and, and most of our board fairly well. So um, it will be good to have her insights as well uh, and, and have a great opportunity for John to be there with us and, and Gwen Carroll Holmes to really get down and discuss um, district board goals, communication, um, roles and responsibilities and governance for the board to, to try and educate as well as um, bring it together to bring to pass a, 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 a smooth a working relationship we can for the benefit of our students. So We also um, highly recommend anyone who can attend the ISBA Summer Leadership Institute. Um, commonly, it's for new board members, but I would like to encourage any existing board members to go. Um, there's going to be three of them. There's one in Caldwell on July 16th, one in Idaho Falls July 17th, and if you really feel the need to go up to Coeur d'Alene, July 24th. <laughs> um, but I'd like to encourage people to, to attend those. Um, they're extremely insightful. Um, 
trainings that we as board members um, need a, a, as a new beginning or as a refresher. So I would like to encourage all those to, to attend those if they can. Chairman Benning, I will send an email out to all board members uh, tomorrow Great. and just reiterate the dates and, and how to register and all that kind of thing. And I will take care of that for you. Okay. So. Sounds good. With that, we'll move on to the highlights, unless anyone has any other announcements. Um, and Liz, I think you hit it on the hit the, the nail on the head tonight with the discussions about graduation. The, the speakers did an amazing job. You know, that, that's, for me, that's truly the, the pay for putting as much time and effort as, as we have, a, have as a board this year, to be able to see the success of our students, to be able to congratulate, shake their hands, and see how happy they are. Um, that really brings it home to me. I'd like to um, really congratulate the, the music departments. Um, mm -hmm. At Silver Creek, Cola Voce and the B-Tones performed. The orchestra, band, all the choirs performed at the Wood River High School graduation. Down in Cary, um, J.C. Park and, and Lily, Lily Rivera did an amazing rendition of the, of the song. So. Um, we're extremely fortunate here in Blaine County to be able to celebrate the arts, to, to you know, we, we've won national awards for, for being very music oriented and, and we have an extremely, we have some extremely talented youth. We really do. So are there any other highlights that anyone else would like to bring up? I have a quick highlight. Um, I was very impressed with what the middle school did with inviting Rose Beal to come and speak. I had the opportunity to hear her talk. She's a Holocaust survivor, and she came and told her story of how she survived the Holocaust and how she made it through and came to America. And um, it was truly an amazing story, and I was so impressed with the students and their behavior for that hour because, I mean, you could hear a pin drop, <laughs> and they were so well-behaved and had fantastic questions, and it was just such an opportunity for our students to really have living history explained to them. It was neat. Thanks for doing that, Fritz. Thanks. I just have one more thing, and this is, I'd like to publicly thank Sean Benyon. <laughs> In between Silver Creek graduation and Wood River High School graduation, he came over to the community campus, took off his tie, and helped set up Senior Bash for four oh, hours. Hours and hours and hours. And it was a critical <laughs> He was lights, hanging posters. I mean, it, it was amazing. And really, we needed him. So thank you so much on the behalf of all the kids who enjoyed the bash. It was very successful. There were no um, incidents that night. And the kids had a great time, and it was wonderful. So thank you, Sean. Yeah. Appreciate, Appreciate that. It. And then he changed his shirt, put on his floor coat, and was ready to go <laughs> for the graduation. graduation. Yeah. yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, stringing up lights just another day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see more carry kids there, too. There was quite a few, um, I don't know if the word got out, um, there were quite a few community school kids. It was an awesome and Catherine worked all year long on it, and she worked from that morning until 24 hours. You worked until yeah. 6 in the morning all night long with her husband until the sun came up. And the birds chirped. <laughs> I'd like to just take a moment, too, to commend um, two of the board members who also served on that. Catherine led that, up, that effort up, and I've and I got to say that that is a, a really amazing event. Mm -hmm. That puts a lot of parents' yep. hearts at ease to know that that graduation night they're locked in. And they're looking, you have all those activities <laughs> planned, all the donations that you get. I think Getter's daughter won the car. Yes. Oh yeah. And, uh, but yes. but Laurel, Liz yeah. also stepped up last minute to volunteer and, and help things out. And Sean and just uh, as parents, because that's a non-school function. Uh, we don't sponsor that in any way, shape, or form. That's a parent thing. That's outside of the school. So. Thank you so much for your volunteerism. Yeah, well, it's a great party. Yeah. It's been going on, I think, for 20 years. Oh, wow. Was it there when your kids were there? Something like that. I worked in Bash in 1990. Uh, there you go. There you go. Yep. 
so it's, it continues and it is a huge success. I mean, you've got Tom back there that secured the car. You know, all of you know all about it. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. everybody's efforts. It yeah. came together nicely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Mo moving on to continuing business, we'll go ahead and go on to consideration of recommended proposals for auditing services. Mr. Mike Chatterton. And board, there's a memo about that in your folder. Okay. Okay. We changed. We're changing auditors this year. We had. Uh, we sent out requests for qualifications to quite a few different accounting firms. Uh, we did check around Blaine County for accounting firms. There's just not any accounting firms within Blaine County that do auditing services specifically for governmental agencies. So, we had four proposals. And they all came from the Twin Falls area, Burley, and Rupert areas. Uh, Dennis Brown submitted a proposal, a proposal for 11505 Condi, Condi Stoker and Associates submitted a proposal for 18100 Ware and Associates submitted a proposal for 17350 Evans and Polson submitted a proposal for $12,000. And when you really dug through the proposals, they, they were very, very really very qualified. Every one of the senior partners in each one of these firms that were committed to working on these audits all had 27 or more years of experience in auditing governmental agencies. And even the backup people that they had to do some of the field work were very, very qualified, 10 years plus in auditing experience. So really, any one of these firms that was selected would have done a great job for the school district and I wouldn't have had any problems with any of them. So what really, it came down to the price. You know, what we did is we asked them for three years worth of guarantees. Uh, Dennis Brown, you know, their proposal was 11505 the first year, 10305 the second year, and 11155 the third year. And they were, you know, they were the cheapest on all three of the proposals, all three of the years. So my recommendation is to hire Dennis Brown and Associates to do the audit for this year and the next couple of years. All right, and on, with that, uh, I think we've had a, an amazing relationship with, I believe it's Morgan. Morgan. Um, and he's, he's done an amazing job auditing for the past number of years, and, and we're excited to see him move on with his life and, and retire within the, the short term. So. Um, Congratulate him on that. And uh, with that, do I hear a, a motion to accept the um, proposal from Dennis Brown for the auditing ex for the fiscal years 2013-14, 2014-15, and fiscal year 2015-16? I'll make that motion. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, okay. He was just really quiet here. <laughs> All right. Motion carries, and um, award of bid goes to Dennis Brown as recommended. All right. We will also stick with Mike and discuss the consideration of sale of the residential construction academy houses in Cary, discussing two of them. Okay, anytime, anytime any governmental agencies have property that they try to sell, it's very, very difficult to sell property. It's a lot easier to purchase property than it is to sell because you have to have, it has to be a sealed bid. You have to have the houses appraised for, the property appraised for. It has to be sealed bids. If the bids come in less than the appraisal value, you have to reject the bids, and then you have to come up with some other way to try to sell those properties, like would be another sealed bid process with another minimum bid, or you could possibly list those properties on the open market and then accept an, a, a price after that. So we have these two houses. Uh, the one is on 101 Waterford Drive. We had an appraisal of $135,000 for that house. And we had an offer to purchase from Jamison and Cassie Sharp, who's a teacher at Cary Elementary School, for $136,000. The other house, 90 Crystal Lakes Drives, 
we had a, a lease agreement on this house, and the gentleman that's uh, leasing the house wanted a first right of refusal in his lease proposal, saying that if the district ever sold the house, that he had the option to buy it for the offering price plus $1,000. And so we had an offer on the house. It, it appraised at 120000 We had an offer on the house from uh, Aaron and Erica Cook from Cary for $125,101. So we gave the option to Mr. Akili to purchase the house for $1,000 more than that. He chose to, uh, to take advantage of that and he is actually by purchasing the house for 126,101 and he chose to exercise his right to purchase the house. So I've been in contact with each one of them. Uh, Suzanne Walsh will be handling the sale of these houses. Uh, so I recommend for a lot of reasons as I addressed in my memo that we that we sell these houses and take advantage of the offers that we have on them right now and the prices that we have that are above the appraisal price. Both both parties are very qualified. There's not going to be issues with loans on either one of them. Mr. Baker. How was the realtor chosen? It, it was chosen. Uh, Suzanne's been doing a lot of our real estate transactions for the sale of these construction houses over the past several years. She, she does a lot of work for us uh, doing market comparables when we're looking at selling houses. She's involved in the design of the houses to see, you know, make recommendations to what the houses look like inside and outside to where they have curb appeal and they're easier to sell. So she does a lot of outside work. Thank you. Is this, is this program wound down now? Is this the end of it, or are we still building houses? These two, two of these houses are the last two that we have in Cary. We still have one additional house in Cary that we're still renting out. And at some point in time, we will be looking at selling it as well. We still have several lots down in Cary in that same subdivision that we own, residential construction lots. We also have one lot in Woodside that we own for that could possibly built on be built on for the Wood River High School. And as far as the construction academies, uh, I believe the Cary House, one of these houses, is they're just finishing up this year, or they just finished up this year, I should say. And to my knowledge, they have not started a new house <coughs> as of yet, and they plan to try and find a few other options to do construction projects where they're not. We're not taking a loss on that. That's Quite right. a big yeah, loss on that. So, um, the construction academies will be continuing, whether they're building a house per se. Um, as far as the board's discussions over the past year and a half, um, we kind of gave them the direction to kind of try and find other projects to accomplish at this point uh, until it changes around. If I understand yeah, the, and actually, the district. We won't be building any new additional houses until you know we approach the board and said maybe the time is right to take a look at that. You know the way we have done that in the past is was we had as many students as we had available to really come up with the designs, doing the market analysis on the houses, to meet with the realtors, to really design the house, to to really come up with a plan to where they feel like those houses will really sell and the curb appeal is really good. So there's a lot of a lot of incentive for those students to do it. They would actually design the houses. They do all the architectural work. They do all of the engineering work through Kep Kevin Lupton's program. They have mentorship with uh, local engineers and local architects who help them design and, and uh, build these houses or design them, go through the planning and zoning commissions, go through city councils, all of the regulatory agencies. So there's a huge learning process for those students. And then you get into the construction aspect of it, where we have all of the trades that come in and, and teach them how to build each one of these individual houses in every phase of that construction. So, Great, thank you. I noticed also in the community, at the community campus there was a room that was dedicated to the. It looked like you know it was just like pieces of houses were being built in there, and windows and stuff. Those are actually sheds that the construction academy 
students are building that they sell to the public. Oh. Oh, let's see. The uh, the one house, the the house that's selling for one hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars, it's going to be about a ninety thousand dollar loss. And the house that was appraised at one hundred and twenty, that's selling for one hundred and twenty-six, there's going to be about a ninety-five thousand dollar loss on those houses. And then you also know that the um, that there's a negative fund balance that's going to be offset for the construction accounting, more or less. Can you just yeah, there's there's a fund balance, a negative fund balance. As we built these houses and purchased the land, the fund balance decreases and decreases until it gets offset by the sale of the house, and then the money goes back into the fund balance. So if you look at it cumulatively over the years, if we've had that, you know, we've been able to buy the land, build the houses, sell the houses, and we have a, a negative $310,000 fund balance in it. These two houses are going to replenish a lot of that negative fund balance and we still have four residential lots that we could sell to cover the rest of the cost. So th that has been in the earlier years with the Construction Academy program there was some substantial gains in those houses over the course of the years too. So you're anticipating by the time we sell all of the houses we will actually be in the black for this program not in the red? Yes. Okay. Even with the losses on these two homes. Yes. Okay. All right. With that, that's discussion action. So, do I hear a motion to accept the price of 136,000 of 100 Waterford Drive to Jameson and Cassie Sharp? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Any opposed? Motion carries. House sold. Do I hear a motion to accept the sale of 90 Crystal Lakes Drive of 126-101 to the current resident? Do I need to have his name? Jewel Akili. Eichle. Jewel Eichle. Mm -hmm. um, do I hear a motion to accept that? Sir? I'll make that motion. I'll second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. With that, we will move on to new business. Um, permission to create a rodeo warm-up area at Nelson Field. Mr. Howard, Howie Royal. Looking sharp tonight, Howie. Thank you. <laughs> so, do you have the, the memo? Do you have an opportunity to read that? Mm -hmm. So, my, the purpose of my request is to allow the district to create a small warm-up area over in the south east corner of Nelson Field down by the ball fields. There's a little corner down there that's not used for much. And the idea is to allow the Sawtooth Rangers to utilize that area for a warm up for the rodeo animals instead of using the infield. So the rec district prepares the infield each year for the ball games for the summer program. And the rodeo and the summer tournaments usually kind of overlap a little bit or coincide. They spend all the time prepping the field, and then we allow the field to be used for warm-up for the rodeo. And then there's a cleanup that occurs, and we never get them quite back to where they should be for the ball tournament. So there was a request last year from the rec district to see if we could make other arrangements for the, the warm-up of the, the rodeo horses. So we've met over there two or three times. We've met with the city of Haley. We've met with the Sawtooth Rangers. And there's a an agreement that's been reached, a verbal agreement, that there would be fencing built, there would be, you know, the, the district would basically incur little or no cost. We would um, we'd have to make a couple sprinkler changes, just pull a couple heads out. There's a couple trees there that were planted a few years ago that were brought in from another location that haven't really done very well, so it wouldn't be a big loss on the trees. But this would be the opportunity for the city to benefit, 
the district to benefit and for the Sawtooth Rangers to benefit. The district would retain the property ownership and the control of, of the property. Is there any liability for them using the district property for warm ups or anything like that? Probably no more than there has been in the past. Um, we've always allowed them to warm the animals up. They they will fence it off. They will provide, if they don't get a permanent fence in this year, they will provide a temporary fence like they have in the past. So it's always, you know, the public's always separated from, from the area. Okay. So this is like a, just a, a part, this is a, would be a permanent warm up area. Yes. Yeah. Like how big? Did I miss that? Tim, can you go to the picture? It's, it's I mean, I did look at the picture. picture. It's about 60 by 125. And it would stay that way all the time? Yeah, it would be fenced off. And the, and the reason for that is because they'd like to not warm up on a sod surface. It gets a little slick if it gets wet. So we would have the city of Haley would pull the sod off. We would arrange for some sand or a dirt mix. And then it would be just a, a fallow corner, basically. Is there any reason not to do this? Or are there any negatives to this? The, the benefit is that we're not, we're not having the conflicts with the ball field. The, the negative would be that we just have a corner that sits, sits idle most of the time. There was talk about maybe putting horseshoes in there, or volleyball or something like that too, make it a multi-use because the roadie only uses it twice a year. Right, right. So, I mean, it, it, could, be, it could be used as something else if that's the case. But there is a lot of... Um, manure that you know yeah. for lack of a you know better term that gets dropped in there so but they do the rangers are great i mean they come in after every event they clean everything up they really do a great job not only that but um i believe this year especially uh the idaho high school athletics association high school rodeo has been at haley as well it's looking at an opportunity for our high school students so it's high school rodeo it's the fourth it's um you know they're they're trying to get more and more events in there too, and if people don't have the opportunity to warm their animals up, they'll, you know, they'll go someplace else. So, the the last paragraph, you know, it's really about an economic benefit of, you know, having as many events there as you can. So, you know, these people come to town, they they spend a lot of money, they stay, they go to the restaurants, they buy fuel. A couple other questions. So, do you feel like this will save actually time and resources from your department from having to clean up the fields? It's, it's not necessarily my department. Or, it's or the, the rec, the rec oh, district. Oh, it's more takes, the rec district. It's more the rec district, uh -huh. yeah. The, the, the request really came from the rec district, but it was something that had been building for a couple of years. Because the horses go into the infield, they, they work it up, they, there's um, tie downs for the bases, they'll get bent. And so it's. Um, and I guess my last question would be for Tom, because this is sort of your playground back here. Uh, you know, do you see any conflicts with this with kids at recess or that this? I don't think we'll be raising any animals over there. What's that? I don't think we'll be raising any animals over there. And kids don't really go over there it's for too far away. Too far. Okay. I just wanted, you know, it seems like this is an unused part of the field, but I just wanted to. As, uh, when you look sure. at that, it's 60 feet wide, so that's probably where that gate is, and then it's going to go out to about 125 feet out there so the only only question I would have have is that in foul territory or it's <laughs> it's not it's not it's, it's not way no. far away all right no. okay it's it's out of play it's out of play yeah then there's no probably you know nothing for us okay thank Mike. you Mike get the mic <coughs> Lori's got it yeah just one second uh, something for Mr. Machen yeah I just want to point out I don't know if you guys remember when we had the land trade with the city of Haley in Wertermer Park that happened where this uh, rodeo arena was actually built. If you remember back years ago, this fence line wasn't in the area that it is now. It actually came from over here over into this area here. And then when we made the trade, we actually owned all of this property, but the fence was placed in the wrong spot. So when we made the trade, we squared up this piece right here. And it actually, I think when we were out there the other day and measured all of it, I think the 60 feet goes right into here somewhere, and it only goes out in here. It doesn't even come close to encroaching into the baseball field or the warm-up areas or anything. Okay. 
Thank you for that clarification. Trustee Schwartz. No, I just said to, I, I like Catherine's question, whether it was going to impact Tom's wall. Okay. All right, if there's no further discussion then, do I hear a motion to grant permission to create a rodeo warm-up area at Nelson Field? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. And under new business, we have Silver Creek High School Team Parenting Center, Mr. Mike Chatterton. Okay. This this uh, Silver Creek High School Team Parenting Center has, has kind of been an issue that we've been looking at for the last year and looking at ways that we could avoid the situations that we were in this year having uh, one student utilize the program and having one staff member in that program. So we looked at, at reducing that staff member and, and tried to come up with solutions that would, that would work out for everybody. And the ideas that we had in the Administrative Council when we were talking about it is if we only had the one student, we would be looking at daycares that would be very close to the actual community campus itself to where the parents could drop off the student or have drop off the kids at a daycare facility and then walk to school and finish school there and close enough to where they could monitor the student. They could go there if they had to during the day. In the meantime, and then that was the recommendation that the Administrative Council made when we were going through the budget process. But in the meantime, uh, we have four students at the alternative school next year that, that want to utilize the daycare facility. That puts us in a whole different situation than we were when we were making those decisions back in the budget session. So we have to look at some kind of a way to either find a solution to keep those kids in school with providing daycare for them, daycare for them, and still make it affordable to the district to provide the services. We've talked with the College of Southern Idaho, we've talked to Blaine County Rec District, and a solution that we've actually, actually looked at was to offer uh, those students at CSI drop-in, some type of a drop-in center to where they could drop off their students to attend college through CSI, or some type of a drop-in center for people that are utilizing FitWorks to where they could go online, sign up for a certain time of a day, drop the kids off, go work out, come back and pick up their kid or two kids or whatever they have. And it would be on, you know, the this, this Silver Creek Alternative School or the Wood River High School kids would have first priority into that. And then everything else would be on a first come, first served basis on you sign up for the times that you want to utilize the program. That way we could keep the program as full as we possibly could and uh, the restrictions would be it would be eliminated limited to six students in there at one point in time anytime you would have more than the six you would have to have an additional staff member so unless the program grew a lot my recommendation would be stay at the six level currently those students that are taking advantage of the program we get a subsidy from the state of idaho to help offset the cost of the daycare of 319 dollars a month for them so you know if we had six students utilizing it that's approximately twenty five hundred dollars a month to offset the costs and if you look at typically a nine month school session you know that covers a good size uh, roughly half of the portion of the daycare for the for the course of the year this would be you know another way that we could help offset the cost of the program too. So I'm, I'm trying to get a feel from the board on where you want me to proceed. You want me to proceed with firming up those relationships with Blaine County Rec District, College of Southern Idaho. Do we want to look at additional daycare facilities around the community campus that we could utilize? In order to do that, we would have to pay for the daycare for those students anyway. So there's going to be some cost. So I really need just some feedback from the school board on where do we want this program to go? What do we want it to look like? How do we want to do this? I appreciate you looking into this issue, Mike, and before I open it up to the, to the board for discussion, 
Um, one of the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the requirements uh, of having an alternative high school is that we offer some type of um, child care um, availability for our students, whether that's in-house or whether that's out-of-house. And, and so it's, it's really twofold. It, it helps our students, um, increases our average daily attendance, which helps our funding from the state, as well as helps us maintain our accreditation for the alternative high school at Silver Creek. Um, keeping those things in mind, I'll go ahead and open that up to, to the board for discussion. I have a bunch of questions. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my first question is, in the past several years, how many students have had children in Silver Creek and how many of those students, do we have data on how many actually utilized the daycare versus had other forms of daycare that they chose to, uh, to use as an option? Well, I know, Mike knows that. yeah, I think Mike Glenn's can, maybe can help answer this, but I'll, I'll start it out with this. I know last year when we started the school year, we had four students that took advantage of it. Now, after the first couple of weeks, it dropped down to two students and then I think it was after the second month it dropped to one student. But so as far as I know, all of the students that were eligible to utilize the program actually did utilize the program. So those students were no longer in our school district? Is that why they stopped utilizing the program then? We had two students that transferred. Okay. One to Jerome, one to uh, Minico. Uh -huh. So the utilization rate is close to 100% of the students who yes. have kids? Yes. in the program. Okay. Um, I need to add one thing else. Okay. Uh, Sean, for, all, for an alternative school to be, uh, we have to apply every year for this, the State Department of Education for alternative school status. And part of the criteria is we have to assure that we do provide child care services, but also we have to provide a parenting uh, component, develop uh, parenting skills. Uh, my next question was, when you're talking about partnering with CSI and FitWorks, how would that, fee I'm assuming there's a fee structure involved, and that would that be similar to like the scale that we have for our preschool, or is it an hourly rate, or how are we going to be doing that? Because we would not get any subsidy for those kids there from the state, correct? We would only get them from the children who were children of students that were in our Silver Creek school. Yeah, yes, and I, I haven't really talked to with CSI or Blaine County Rec District on any type of a fee schedule, mm -hmm. but I didn't envision any type of a fee schedule based on need. It would all be based on what is the competitive rate within the area. Okay, so it wouldn't be a sliding scale. It would be just a fixed rate of what would be competitive. Uh, that would be my feeling. Okay. Um, the next question was when you investigated options for doing this outside of having it within our school um, and surrounding areas, did you find suitable options and what were the cost of those option, options in comparison to the cost of maintaining the program within the school? We've Assuming four students or what you are anticipating for our our yeah, that, that's going to be very hard. I, I, once, we, once I found out that we were going to have four students next mm -hmm. year, I didn't go any farther in looking at daycare facilities that are currently around the area, mm -hmm. other than the fact that we did look at how many daycares there are around that area. There's just not a lot of daycares that are in that area that's what I would consider walking distance to the to or the alternative public school. transportation distance, perhaps? Or public transportation district, mm -hmm. as well as a lot of the daycares. Most, a lot of daycares just don't take infants. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the students that would be taking advantage of this program would have infants that age. It's we're, not... We're going to have two infants in the fall. Can you use your mic? We're going to have two infants in the fall. Okay. So if, if we outsource daycare, I don't see those two girls going to school. Okay. Because they're infants. And daycare typically is about $1,000 a month. For infants. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if we're thinking that students would not participate in school if that was outsourced, why were we project, why were we presented with that as a, a possibility from admin council? Because if we felt like students wouldn't actually use that. 
because at the time we were making that decision, there mm -hmm. was only the one student that was the possibility, the one that went through the school year this year. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that there was other students that were pregnant or having kids that would be utilizing the program till after that decision was made. So we were looking for a situation for one infant for one student. Mm -hmm. And we felt like that that was definitely a possibility to do. Roughly with the benefit package and the salary package for the employee would be about $35,000 a year. Plus the additional space that we're using at the community campus, correct? Which is minimum. Yes. And would that be an ongoing cost? In other words, would we be hiring somebody and utilizing the space? We couldn't have that and have for the past three, two years, something like that, and, and have had that cost currently in the budget for the past yeah. few years. Well, exactly, and I'm sort of trying to weigh what would be, would it be theoretically cheaper to do it, to outsource it, if that were possible? It would, um, because yeah. The What's the break-even point? Exactly. Yeah. Theoretically, it'd probably be cheaper to outsource it, but I, would, I don't think if we outsourced it, we would get the student participation into the alternative school just because it's an additional mm -hmm. headache for them. I mean, they have, to, they have to find the transportation. Even if they're taking public transportation, by the time they get off the bus, drop their kid off to the daycare, get back on the bus, which is going to be another additional time, mm -hmm. you know, that, that makes it a long day for those students. And then... You know, by the time the student has to leave school to go check on the infant, to take care of it, you know, all of the other situations that they have to deal with, then, you know, that takes them away from the school. And, it and that makes perfect sense. I guess one question I have is, do you think it would be possible to, uh, for example, at Healy Elementary, they've, they've got the, the YMCA after school program there. Do you think it would be possible to uh, bring in a daycare? I like Head Start being at the community campus for the older kids. Uh, yeah, but it's for older kids. Yeah. yeah. No, Head Start is currently at the community campus, oh, okay. and but that's I think a three and four year old program. Three to five. Three to five year old program, pre K. Six. You also have something about um, they can receive some type of certification that they could become a licensed daycare right. provider. Right. So they, they, if they complete the program, mm -hmm. the three classes, uh, they will be certified in daycare. So they'll leave not only with parenting skills, but in early childhood development, but they'll also leave with a certificate. So, Trustee Grace. Um, this is, I guess, just a little. Um, Concerns I have if we open it up to FitWorks or CSI. Right now, if there's four kids in the fall, that only leaves two slots. And you may get an overwhelming response of, you know, from CSI and FitWorks and drop-in. And I don't think we really want to get into the daycare business of opening a big facility. So I would worry about getting too much response for that and then not knowing what to do. I mean, if we have two slots open and I don't know what, how that would work, 
but we would probably want two consistent kids to be there instead of a, it would just be a lot for that one, you know, I guess Desiree, Desiree to manage that and who would manage, you know, then it becomes more of a facility, I guess, instead of, you know, the Blaine County School District or Silver Creek Daycare Parenting Center. Yeah. And I so guess the Teen Parenting Center is the Blaine County School District Teen Parenting Center. Right. In, our, in the building. Right. But there's a possibility of having six. Right. And I guess that would be just something to think oh, through. I'm just six? sort of I'm just yeah. sort of yes. thinking this through and how that would look. Um, just something to think about over the next you know couple weeks. And those are just thoughts that come to mind. I just wouldn't want this overwhelming response and to have Desiree to have to figure this out and have to manage that. The way we I do like the idea of getting some more income to fill those two spots. Or four, depending on. Or four yeah, spots. Or I just don't know whatever. how that would work. It would just be something to think through. Yeah, I think that that would be up to her, right? I mean, she, she would be running it. Um, the other thing is, I, and I, I really appreciate this topic. I think it's a big one. I also think that it's, I, I guess that we're being asked to provide some suggestions to you or some input. That if there's no vote here, is that right? Yeah, this is only inf information okay, today. Okay, great. Um, you know, as a matter of what we're doing, it's it's a thirty-five thousand dollar piece, which is you know, it's it's a chunk, but it's it's I don't know how much discussion it's worth in terms of our time. I think it's a, it's a small item um, in in the greater scheme of things, and I think that. Okay, yeah. Can I just say one more thing? We have sure. a girl, a freshman girl, who will be a sophomore. She's due in August. She lives in Northport. And she takes the school bus all the way down here. And she'll have that baby. And so she's going to have a baby. She's going to be in school full time. She's a good student, works hard. She really is serious about this. And she has contact with the baby during school. That's a very important piece to this. You know, it's not just a, a, a salary number. It's, it's about a young girl trying to finish her education. Now, we outsource that. Just think of the complications for a little sophomore girl that does not drive. Parents don't drive. What's she going to do? She's not going to finish school. I don't see her staying in school. In fact, she's already made that statement. Is that accurate? She she can't she can't wrap her head around that. So, and then we have another girl that's a senior who dropped out, who's coming back to finish. She has one more semester to finish uh, her school. You know, I think that this year there's n it, it doesn't sound like anybody on the board is wanting to. Um, uh, get rid of the program by any stretch. As a matter of fact, I think that there's more of a need than ever, um, which is, you know, a shame. Um, however, it is what it is, and I just, yeah, I think that, I, I don't know if anyone disagrees that, it, it, I guess that that's the question. Um, I think, Mike, you were just asking for some direction on if you should pursue relationships with CSI and FitWorks. Is that what you're really asking the board for? Th that's what I'm asking for. Is, so that you would just present more information at next month's meeting to go forward with? To come up with some kind of a plan. My envision on how this would work was is, you know, you log on to the Internet, you have time slots to where you can pick, and you sign up for each one of these time slots for the people that are utilizing FitWorks. That would be a little bit easier for CSI students because they would have a set schedule, you know, and they could go out, you know, six months if they wanted to or three months for the semester and plug in those times if they wanted to. But, you know, I, I envision if we could utilize it through CSI, that's the best option. I guess it would be my recommendation that if the administration feels that this is manageable and something that could work within the system and making that recommendation that I'm okay with them investigating it and bringing more information back next month. Sure. Uh, I can I, I think the investigation it doesn't hurt to have the discussions. Um, I do worry about um, varying schedules, dropping off and picking up with infants in there, uh, and sometimes the needs that they, they require, and the attention that they require. Um, so I do have concerns about that, with the varying schedule of uh, people coming in and dropping off and picking up. But, uh, but I'm open to at least the investigations and discussions with that look like. I would just say one last thing. I'd love to see the priority be the, obviously, the Silver Creek uh, girls, and then any women who are going to CSI and then the FitWorks. Okay, I'll get to you one more thing. 
<laughs> so, CSI. Lucy just graduated from Civil Creek with her baby. She had a baby last year. It's what it's all about. That's what the program is for. She graduated. She is going to CSI. And she's the one who su successfully completed the uh, child the CSI courses. Mm -hmm. She is going to CSI. Okay. She's received a, a couple scholarships. She's going to continue, and she has indicated she will definitely use daycare so she can continue her education. So we know her and also Erica Lopez, another former uh, Silver Creek student who's going to re enroll at, at CSI. So. So you look sounds like you're almost your fault. <laughs> okay, Mr. Black. I know public you know comment is, is next, so I think about making one statement then, but um, just just in support of that. Um, I'm the first person in my family to graduate high school. Excuse me. <laughs> my mother dropped out at the age of sixteen and had me. And did not finish. So um, and my father was eighteen and joined the service back then he didn't high school diploma to join the service. Um, so, um, and due to my mother's level of education, neither, none of my siblings graduated high school. So I can tell you that when most young ladies graduate high school, it doesn't just affect them, mm -hmm. it affects several generations post them. And a perfect example is that all of my children have graduated high school. Two have gone on to college because I broke that my mother wasn't given that option or that opportunity. And even though it's sad, the fact is that that has always existed. And what's cool about it is we are now addressing those issues where before those those women disappeared. Even when I was in high school, a girl got pregnant, she didn't see her again. So what's really nice is that we're providing that opportunity for young women to finish their education and, and to be able to provide for their families. And so just a personal note. Thanks. Appreciate that. What would a world class organization do? <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. So, Mark, do you feel you have the, the information that you're seeking? Yes. Direction? Okay. All right. With that, we will go ahead and move on to public comment regarding tonight's agenda, if there is any. Ms. Browning, if you wouldn't mind stepping up. Really. To the podium, please. Would you mind stepping up to the podium for the broadcast, <laughs> stating your name and address, thank you. <laughs> Barbara Browning, Hewlin Meadows, Blaine County, for 48 years. I agree with John completely. When this daycare center was first proposed, I was not in favor of it. I have changed my mind completely. John has legitimate points for the cost. Please just keep it. Do it. Don't worry about it. Thank you for your Thank comment. You. Ms. Dahlgren. Hi, I'm Julie Dahlgren, and you're probably going to think I'm going to talk about daycare because, as you know, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I do want to say that as, as a, for a historical uh, perspective, it was grassroots. It was started by a desire, a strong desire from some students at Wood River High School. And we carried it out, and this is a great conversation. And uh, the heart, the heart of it, we're we're here to educate all students, <clears throat> whether they're quirky or however you want to look at it. That's our job, and the the the, the daycare center helps them. <clears throat> the other item I wanted to discuss, which is related to the agenda, is um, uh, representation. Well, it has to do. I'm going to segue into it from the Financial Advisory Committee, um, which I know is on hold for a while, but um, a number of years ago, it was the, the board, each trustee was um, entrusted to find people from their own zone. And Blaine County School District is a really good example of a unified school district that works um, from the north to the south. It's unified. And I would think that in choosing some of your committees, whether it be wellness or financial, that the board would make some effort to either strong arm a member of their uh, zone or really make an effort to try to find somebody with qualifications for these committees. And that's, that's all I have to say. I think it would be a wise idea because, you know, you really want to front load some votes. Uh, in the future, you might have a facilities levy. Uh, God forbid you should ever lose the stabilization funding 
but you might have to go out to the public to ask for some money. And if you've got a zone that's not represented, uh, you've probably lost some votes. So I'm just making that as a suggestion. So thank you. Great meeting. Appreciate your comment. Any other comments? All right. Is there anything the board deems necessary to, I believe that's correct verbiage, um, <laughs> <coughs> items both board necessary deems necessary? No. All right. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I'll um, make that motion. All in favor? We're all rushing. All right. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned at 7.